I'm Eric the Travel Guy. Fantastic experiences await you just beyond your own backyard. So join me for the next 30 minutes as we learn more about and explore Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. My name is Eric Hastings. Yeah, that's me. And for as long as I can remember, I've always loved to travel. And I still do today. Airlines, hotels, cruises, new places, delicious food, I love all of it. And that's why I've been traveling the world professionally for more than a decade. But what troubles me these days is that Americans are leaving paid vacation time on the table each year at an alarming rate. Well, I want to help fix that. So please consider this a personal invitation to join me each week on my mission to get you traveling more than ever before. Because while the world is a pretty big place to explore, your next vacation is waiting to be discovered not just around the globe, but perhaps just around the corner. Let me introduce you to the places, people, and secrets I've discovered that remind me just how exciting it is to be alive and hopefully will inspire you to get out of the house and into your next great adventure. I am Eric the Travel Guy, and this is Beyond Your Backyard. Thank you for watching and welcome back to Pennsylvania, a state filled with a multitude of experiences. We're talking big cities, rich farmland, and gorgeous vistas. Today, we're in Gettysburg, a town rich with history. But this is gonna be a phenomenal episode because we're gonna show you the Gettysburg that's bound to surprise you. We'll get on the battlefield where more than 50,000 men were lost, injured, or went missing during the Civil War. We'll walk in the exact footprints of our 16th president, but we'll also learn how Gettysburg is evolving beyond its prominent place in American history. Let's get started. To help you get your geographic bearings, we've got our trusty map here. Ooh, that's a nice map. Now, before we go any further, remember, Pennsylvania became the second state in the U.S. by ratifying the Constitution on December 12, 1787. But as a political entity, Pennsylvania began in 1681 when William Penn received a charter from King Charles II. Now, it's worth noting, Native American tribes had been on this land for what some archaeologists believe for thousands of years prior. Now, the borders of Pennsylvania were essentially established around the late 1700s. Had the outcome of history gone another way, we could have had two states, including Pennsylvania and Westylvania. But that's a discussion for another episode. Getting back to today, Gettysburg is located here, about a 45 minutes drive south from the state capital of Harrisburg along State Route 15. With a relatively small year-round population, Gettysburg is the county seat of Adams County. This is a four-season destination, and the locals love the outdoors. Thousands of visitors flock here to see living history from both the colonial period and the Civil War era. You'll love walking in the quaint downtown, shopping for souvenirs, eating in the diners, coffee shops, bars, and restaurants. They even have a farmer's market. Some stay downtown at the Gettysburg Hotel, but what you won't find is big skyscrapers here. In addition to history, visitors come year-round for ghost tours and to explore the great outdoors but they also come for farm-to-table culinary offerings, wineries and cideries. Gettysburgians love their cider, so I decided to learn why Gettysburg and Adams County is the place for cider by visiting with Ben Wank of Plowman Cider at Three Springs Farm. Nice place you got here. What do you have, 500 acres here? A little short of 500 acres, 450 or so, oh yeah. Oh my gosh, and, and seventh generation? Seventh generation to farm in the area, yeah. And we're talking primarily apples, yep. right? A lot of apples. What kind of apples are you growing out here? At least 50 varieties. Last time I stopped to count, uh, apples for grocery stores, apples for uh, products like uh, applesauce and apple juice, right? and then uh, apples for making uh, alcoholic cider as well. Which is, frankly, my favorite. Uh, but did I understand this correctly? Did, did you say that you can trace back any Macintosh apple you pick up, you can pretty much figure out what tree it came from? What are you talking yeah. about? That's crazy. Sure, so all apples that are in commercial orchards are really kind of two organisms grafted together. You have a root stock yep. and then you have uh, the scion or the variety that you're trying to grow and, and all of those varieties are kind of propagated and reproduced by cuttings. Mm -hmm. So they're all genetically similar. They all have to be cut from an existing tree of that variety and then grafted by your nurseryman onto a root stock and the root stock kind of controls how that tree grows to what size, what height, how it branches. 
uh, different diseases and pests it might be more or less susceptible to. Right. A variety of things. I mean, you're like, what is it, the fourth largest in the state or something? It's like some... Yeah, it's the fifth largest county by production in the United States is Adams County, Pennsylvania. You literally can take a, a bushel, for lack of a better description, of apples, mm -hmm. and based on what you put in that bushel, you already have an idea of what you think it's going to taste like coming out of cider? Sure, well, it's... That's uh, crazy. Like, yeah. that, to me, that's that's awesome. You know, every year's different, and mm -hmm. in that way, it's very similar to making a wine. Like, this year's quality of, let's say, Arlet apples is, you know, it's a little bit better at fruit than what we worked with last year. You can kind of, you know, do different things based on you know, what the apples are telling you to do. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not very formulaic. We're really kind of letting nature and letting the apples decide what the most appropriate use for them is every time we're trying to blend a cider. How's the culinary scene here at Adams County? Oh, days? it's it's coming coming on fast. And, you know, so many of the, the agricultural products and, the, and the, the produce that's used in some of these fine dining restaurants and mm -hmm. in D.C., Baltimore, Philadelphia, it's grown right here. Mm -hmm. um, and to see local chefs embracing that opportunity of being so close to the source and using those products in really fun, creative ways, is it's, it, it makes me really proud to, to be from Adams County. It's, mm -hmm. it's a really awesome up and coming thing. How do you describe Gettysburg and Adams County to somebody who's never been here before. A lot of the things that I'm traveling to go see, whether it be, you know, the the rolling hills of Napa Valley, or or you know, taking in some history, or or, or you know, dining at nice restaurants. Like we have a lot of those things right here that I, I go and I have those experiences. It just makes me more proud to be back back home at the end of the day. It's beautiful here. After my conversation with Ben, I spent the afternoon exploring the apple orchards. I stopped by Hollabach Brothers Fruit Farm and Market. I did a tasting at Reed's Winery, checked in on the Mason Dixon for small plates and a craft cocktail. I even made a visit to the farmer's market in downtown. And no, I don't recommend shooting olive oil. What I learned is that there's a culinary revolution going on here, and it's not limited to just cider. Classically trained and award-winning chefs are setting up shops in and around Gettysburg because of the abundant variety of fresh, local ingredients. Fiddler & Company is an example of just that. The menu is created by chef owner Josh Fiddler based on seasonal inspiration and ingredient availability. The pizzas and breads are to die for. Elsewhere around town, the locals grab a diner-style breakfast at Ernie's Texas Lunch. They get a coffee or tea and homemade pastry at Ragged Edge. But while you'll find your share of modern day chain eateries, Gettysburg has never forgotten its historic culinary roots. Do you ever stop to consider what was on the menu in the mid 1800s? Oh, well, you're in luck. Make your way over to the Dobbin House. You will love the food, you'll love the costume servers, and you'll be dining in one of the oldest structures in town. Step back in time with a menu filled with 1860s fare, delicious steaks and chops, fresh seafood, I suggest you make a reservation. There's a word I'm searching for, and no, it's not giant elephant. It's authenticity. You see, when you bring your children here to Gettysburg, you're exposing them to authentic experiences, from history to culture to culinary to the great outdoors. So remind them to look up from their phones. Oh, and bring them here to Mr. Ed's Elephant Museum and Candy Emporium. If your kids are like mine, they are tech savvy, but they also love candy. This is just one of the many places you can connect as a family without the technology. And to take that concept even further, you simply have to get outdoors. That's why we dropped in on Strawberry Hill Nature Preserve. So we are surrounded by nature, we're surrounded by trails, surrounded by opportunities to engage with it. As soon as you get out, um, the first thing people usually see is our, our pink log cabin, which is actually a 1798 log cabin. It's made of American chestnut. That is kind of a homing beacon. Folks go right there, they find our trail map, and they see that there are 10 miles of trails they can explore, there's creeks that they can play in, mm -hmm. um, and much more beyond our borders. The last time I was on a hike, it wasn't so much the going, it was the coming back part. Sure. Most of our trails are set up as loops. Mm -hmm. So you're going out one way and you're coming back a completely different way. And we have loops stacked on top of loops. So you can go for a mile or you can go for five. We have photographers come out. We have birders. Um, we occasionally host stargazing programs. So if the night is more your thing or owl prowls, we have those as well. And you have an owl. We do have an owl, yes. Tell he's, me about this. Uh, he's a barred owl. Mm -hmm. People fall in love with him 
right away. Mm -hmm. In November, we host the Twisted Turkey Trail Tussle. It's a 5K, 10K, and 15K race. It's become a big community festival for us, and we love seeing about 200 to 250 people out for it each year. We're staying in Gettysburg, mm -hmm. and what's nice is that we can kind of use that as sort of the hub and branch out and do things both in Adams County and just outside of Adams County, right? Adams County is full of opportunities to get out into nature. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of state parks that are wonderful. There's Cadoras and there's Caledonia, which are on the east and west sides of the county respectively, um, which have lakes and hiking trails as well. If you want kayaking on a lake, then uh, Cadoras is your place. Mm -hmm. If you want to maybe hit a creek, then uh, Caledonia is more where you want to go. We can do horseback riding, I'm assuming, yes. all that kind of good stuff. So one of the other annual events that we have and love is our Maple Sugaring Festival. We call it Mount Hope Maple Madness. And it's every year on the last Saturday in February and the first Saturday in March. And we see about 600 people over those two days come out for pancakes. We have a, a sure. all-you-can-eat pancake right. buffet. Is it too early for flapjacks? <laughs> I say never. no, never. Um, we also take them on tours out on the property to see everything from tapping a tree to cooking it down into syrup, and then they get to taste it at the end because that's the best part. Getting to all of these outdoor activities with your family, you're definitely going to need a car. But this is a good thing because getting behind the wheel on the twists and turns of these highways will remind you just how beautiful this country is. It was after the battle when all the men lay on the ground, all 5,000 horses, 50,000 men, and that's when the Undertakers came to town. You see, as far as I can tell, there's three types of people in this world. Those who believe in ghosts, those who don't, and and everybody else is somewhere in the middle. Well, thousands of people flock to Gettysburg every day to learn more about the paranormal activity here. So I say, take a tour. The American Civil War was a turning point in this nation's history. Hundreds of thousands of men fought for their beliefs. Here in Gettysburg, in just three short days in 1863, more than 50,000 brave soldiers would be killed, injured, or go missing. But why was this battle so significant? And why did it change the course of history? For that, we turn to Chief Historian Christopher Gwynn. Well, the Battle of Gettysburg is significant to the course of the American Civil War because it happens at about the midway point of the war, so the summer of 1863. It's the first time that the Union Army of the Potomac decisively defeats the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia led by Robert E. Lee. The first two years of the war, Confederates by and large have been dominating the battlefield, at least in Virginia and Maryland. And this is the first time that the Union Army was really able to decisively crush the Confederate Army. But it's also important because it, I think it's part of the story of who we are as Americans. What does it mean to be an American? Really, that's a big part of what the American Civil War is about. 1863 is a, is a pivotal year in the American Civil War. So as I mentioned, by and large, here in the East, most of the major battles have been fought in Virginia and Maryland. But Robert E. Lee, commander of the Army of Northern Virginia, knows that if he's going to achieve Confederate independence, if the, if the Confederate Army is going to ultimately triumph in the American Civil War, uh, he has to do something uh, audacious. He has to do something that's going to kind of be a game changer. So Lee's plan in the summer of 1863 is to take his army of about 75,000 men and invade the north. Right. So cross the Potomac River, move through Maryland, and hopefully get to Pennsylvania. I was going to say, he was on his way to Philadelphia. I mean, like, well, was there, a, was there were, were there aspirations to go that far? I think Lee's goal is to show the people of the north how terrible war is. And if he can make the people of Philadelphia or Washington, D.C. or New York City think that they're under threat by a Confederate army, the psychological effect of that alone is, is, is uh, worth a lot to Lee. Because that might convince uh, voters in 1864 to vote for someone other than Abraham Lincoln, to vote for an American president that will recognize the Confederacy. <laughs> so so we're, we're talking about, uh, of course, military strategy. We're talking all of those things. But we're also talking about a, this is a political campaign to change the hearts and minds through demonstration. Did I get that right? Yeah, yeah, you did. L uh, Robert E. Lee recognizes the connection between what happens on the battlefield to what happens in, in the White House from the halls of Congress. For the first time in United States history, there's a draft. And there are draft riots that erupt all throughout the North. Mm -hmm. uh, for a lot of people who live in Minnesota, Michigan, New Hampshire, Ohio, they're wondering, you know, when the heck is this war going to be over? Are we even going to win it? And now Robert E. Lee's in Pennsylvania. Didn't the cavalry play a role here? Well, cavalry in a lot of ways is the reason that the Battle of Gettysburg is fought when and where it is. 
So for the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia, uh, Robert E. Lee depends on his cavalry to provide him information so that he can conduct the campaign. It's like your iPhone. So you're going on a road trip, you type in your destination, it's gonna tell you where to go, it's gonna give you traffic, it's gonna help you make decisions. Uh, and cavalry for Lee does the same thing. The problem is for most of the first part of the Gettysburg campaign, Robert E. Lee is without his cavalry. His cavalry gets separated from the main body of his army. So Lee invades Pennsylvania and he doesn't have a real good idea of what's down the road. He doesn't know where the Union Army is. So he's operating what we would call a fog of war. Now, meanwhile, in the Union Army, Union Cavalry is doing exactly what cavalry should be doing. They're scouting out in front of the main body of the army. They're providing the army commander, in this case, George Meade, with the information he needs to make decisions and to conduct the campaign. And Meade, relatively new in this role by a matter of days, days. before, right? Wasn't it like three? It's the middle of the night. Someone enters his tent and tells him, OK, now you're in command of 95,000 men. Did he know what he was doing? Well, Meade was a professional soldier. So he had served in the Mexican War. He had served in the peacetime army. But I don't think anyone can be prepared for that amount of pressure and that amount of stress to all of a sudden kind of dumped in your lap. Right. So the casualties here, I mean, this is really significant. Uh, but 51,000 Americans over the course of three days are wounded, mangled, captured, missing. We simply don't know what happened. Did anybody have any idea it was going to be that significant? I think both sides recognized that the next battle that was to be fought uh, could very well decide, uh, for me, the fate of the Republic, uh, for Lee, the course of the war. Right. So I think there was an understanding that the battle that was going to be fought uh, in the summer of 1863 in Pennsylvania was going to be pivotal. Uh, whether or not either side could have envisioned the amount of carnage created by the battle is another thing. Uh, you know, Gettysburg uh, is even today one of the, the bloodiest battles ever waged in the Western Western Hemisphere. And it's really the largest man-made disaster to ever occur in the United States. And I don't think there's any way you can prepare for that. Uh, particularly in 1863, there's no Red Cross, there's no insurance, there's no FEMA, right. there's no National Guard. Now we're starting to see images of that. And they, they saw those images relatively quickly, correct? Well, most Americans at the beginning of the, the American Civil War, both in the North and in the South, their idea of what war looked like was very, um, it was detached from the reality of war. So uh, two photographic teams from Washington, D.C. come to the battlefield. And so the, the horror of what war actually is, is conveyed to the American people through these images of mangled men, dead horses littering this Pennsylvania countryside. Right. And it changed how people thought about the war. It changed how people perceived the war. When people come out to the battlefield for the first time, mm -hmm. what are they going to see? I think a lot of individuals, when they travel to Gettysburg, think they're going to encounter a relatively small park, uh, a few monuments. When they arrive, they encounter a battlefield, a preserved landscape, 7,000 acres, a 24-mile uh, tour route through the battlefield. It's, it's a lot bigger. It's a lot more expansive than most, most people, I think, imagine. Uh, and the museum here is a great example of that. And when you visit a place like Gettysburg, 150 years of time seems to shrink a little bit. And I think by going to places like Little Round Top and exploring the battlefield and seeing uh, the downtown buildings, some of which still have, have artillery rounds lodged in them and have been uh, you know, beaten up by shot and shell, it, it makes the, that huge span of time seem much smaller, much more relatable. And all of a sudden, uh, I think the, the individuals who fought here, they become uh, real people. They, they merge from these kind of black and white photographs to real individuals. Mm -hmm. And I think it also highlights the fact that so many of the issues that we were dealing with as a, as a nation in the 1860s are still very real today. So you pick up a newspaper today and I guarantee you, you'll find an article about race in America. You'll right. find an article about the role of federal government uh, in the everyday lives of Americans. You'll, uh, you'll read about the, uh, you know, what it means to be an American and who gets to be part of that. The scope and severity of a civil war seems almost unimaginable today. But by visiting Gettysburg, you'll begin to truly understand how this battle changed the course of American history. Our thanks to Chris. A tour of this historic battlefield is simply not complete without visiting the cemeteries. On November 18, 1863, President Lincoln, a few members of his cabinet and personal secretaries arrived at the train station in downtown Gettysburg. He was escorted to the Wills House, where he spent the night and completed the address that history would never forget. The Wills House is part of the National Park Service and is open to the public. You could take a tour, see exactly where Abraham Lincoln slept, and take photographs of this iconic location. The next morning, he gave what is now known as the Gettysburg Address. 
Now, some of you may recall a few words from the beginning or even the closing sentence. But remember, it took just over two minutes for President Lincoln to make a profound impact on the nation. Let's listen. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus so far nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from this earth. So how do you sum up Gettysburg in a word? You don't. You just have to see it for yourself. I'm Eric the Travel Guy. Thank you for exploring beyond your backyard. Mm. And your poster is unbelievable. Let me tell you another thing I'm thinking about. <laughs> Last time I went over here, I saw a ghost. I've been looking for that ghost for 38 years. Guy owes me 20 bucks. No, sometimes I like to get in the car <laughs> and just drive around. Oh. <laughs> Does anybody want to talk about the fact that I'm not wearing my glasses driving? <laughs> have you been on the fruit and wine trail? Sunshine, I have been on a fruit and wine trail my whole life. Okay, so I don't know.